Good afternoon, Berlin. Let's get stuck into things. A bat and ball cost $1.10. The bat costs $1 more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Have a little think. Ready? Who got this answer? Hands up, please. Great. You got one of two possible answers. What you, though, got was the cognitive miser answer, the one that used a shortcut in the brain. This actually isn't the real answer. The real answer is five cents. And if you look in the graphic on, on that side, it really does, it, it does add up to kind of five cents. So that's one example of us thinking that we're rational, but actually acting irrationally. The reason behind the cognitive miser is that your brain is actually trying to save mental energy. The brain is ama an amazing thing, and we actually make, on average, 35,000 decisions in a day. But that mental energy is a finite resource, and we suffer over the day something called decision fatigue. So by the end of it, it's almost as if we're drunk when we're making decisions. But that's just the tip of the iceberg, really. There we go. Why are we all here today? And why am I speaking up here? Well, biases are really, really important to us because we're all here to create apps and experiences that really offer kind of long-term relationships with the customers. We're all aiming for high engagement and high perceived value from customers for our products. But we can use biases in, positive, in a positive way and a guiding light in a simplification process to guide them through the journey of our app in a really nice and simple way. Two scenarios. Which would you prefer? The number involved above is number of monthly active users in your app. I think we'd all agree that we'd rather 3 million rather than 800,000. Let's add one data point to that, engagement. Scenario one now has low engagement, but scenario two has got high. And by engagement, I'm defining that as the percentage of people completing your core action. A core action, for example, would be complete, posting a tweet on Twitter, pinning, a, pinning an item on a board on Pinterest. So actually, in this, which, which of the two would you rather? I'd highly and strongly suggest that we'd actually focus on the 800,000 and the high engagement. The three million is really just a vanity metric. Let's go six months into the future. And now we've seen how focusing on high engagement and that's leading to high retention, you've been able to build up the monthly active users to five million. And so that's with using these little nudges, these little biases, these guiding lights to help your customers along the journeys within the apps that you've built. Having been in this business for a long time, um, there's a few questions we ask ourselves when we're designing and building apps. Simple questions, really. Is it clear what the app does? In that first five or 10 second experience for the customer, really, are you getting the value across? Are you providing that hook? In terms of value as well, generally, to create value, you either save people time, save people money, or enhance an experience, or it's a combination of the three. So sit, think about how you're actually creating value for the customer. And also going back to that core action, try and design that whole experience of your app around that specific, simple core action, and use those biases to kind of help them along the way to complete that core action. Also, along that journey, how can you provide a sense of progress to make them feel like they're progressing to the end goal? We live in a very noisy world. We've got push notifications, social messages, adverts, emails, phone calls, all from all sorts of different devices. We live in an age of, dis of distraction. With that in mind, it's never been more important to consider a few things, specifically context and past behavior when you're thinking about sending triggers uh, out to your customers. Even better, 
you can, you can, there are now SDKs available that allow you to look at the past behavior, the, the, the habits, and the lifestyle of your users and predict when is best to send out those push, push notifications as, as used by my days uh, using the, uh, the Neura SDK. It's amazing the kind of tools that we've got access to. Also worth considering other, other tools like the Google Awareness API, which can provide a sense of context to your, to your app in terms of what, user, what the state the user's in. Are they driving? Are they walking? Do they have their headphones plugged in? These little nuances to, to how and when you're pushing out triggers really have a long-term positive effect on your retention and engagement. The power of defaults. This is often overlooked, but hugely, hugely useful to simplifying the customer's experience. Here we've got a top-up wheel for a mobile coffee loyalty app. There are seven segments. Now, the, the numbers in green, which one of those do you think we should place in the default highlighted segment in the wheel? Anyone? Give me a shout. 10? 30? OK, we've got, we got some smart people here. 30. So 30 um, is correct. Simply, I mean, we, we chose 30 as the default here because it was in the middle of the range. And um, the end result of that was that the average top-up value was roughly around 20 pounds here, where originally the business thought it was going to be around 10 pounds. Now, with all these biases and guiding lights and nudges, um, it's, all, it's great to, to uh, integrate into an app, but it really does have a positive long-term effect. And this was uh, the case with this specific app, that 50% of orders were coming from the app for certain, for certain stores. And that compares to the market leader in the coffee space having an average of 21% of orders coming from the app. So these little nudges really help. I think a huge number of us have heard of the classic jam jar experiment, whereby 24 jams compared to six jams, the 3% of the, the people who are shown 24 jams uh, buy a jam compared to 40% of people who buy one of, one of the six. So that's called the paradox of choice. And this applied to menu design here. I start off with showing 50 options. So you've got every option under, under the sun on the, the starting screen. Obviously, too, far too many. You're in, introducing cognitive load into the experience. You're making a user work too hard. So let's just apply some, some kind of common sense to that list. And we end up with the second screen, 10 options. There's still a scrollable list, but we can do so much more for the customer. The ideal could be just one user, well, well, sorry, one, uh, one option the smart, the perfect option, the perfect option that takes into account the context. That's true, but it's also worth considering the last screen on, on, the, on the far hand side of providing three options. Why would you want to provide three options? To give a sense of choice to your customer, to, to allow them to control their journey through your app. All these behavioral biases are really kind of stemming from the last 60 years of, of research in behavioral science. But new concepts and theories are coming out on a weekly basis. There's a problem, though, in that they're really largely very dry, very academic, maths written sometimes, actually hard to get hold of, um, and fundamentally also not very practical in their original form. So we discovered this particular problem two or three years ago and decided to create a little microsite called cogload.com, which basically is a collection of all these lovely behavioral biases pulled together into one location, but redesigned and rewritten so that it's in a format that's digestible, understandable, and also practical to us who are the designers and developers of today's products and the future. So, Cogload.com, and I might have something to give out later on. With all this speak about biases, how best do you integ integrate this thinking into the way that you're designing and building your apps? 
One of the methods that, that we've got is, we call it the Coglo Focus Method. We have biases on, every, on a whole stack of cards. We, we put it all out on the table, and collectively, within, within the team, we look at what's most applicable uh, to that particular scenario, to that brand, and we make sure that everyone understands the biases. Then you go off in your individual little corners of the room and brainstorm ideas around how to integrate that, how to best integrate that bias into the experience for the benefit of the customer. Also, it's worth keeping in mind the values of the, of the client or the, the product, the str strategy that you've got, and also think about the emotion that you're looking to evoke by someone using your, your tool or app. Then come back to sit together, present your best idea uh, to the team, but think about the, the actual problem that you're looking to tackle, present the idea, how it aligns with the brand, present also the assumptions and risks you think are involved in that, and how you're going to test, make, make that minimal test, and who's going to be involved in that. The Memrise app, one of my most favorite apps in the world. And I just wanted to take a moment to focus you in onto the very top of the screen, the green area. This is the first time this screen has been shown to me, the user, the first time user. But there's two ticks here. This is what's called the endowed progress effect. And it's a feeling that you've already made a great start. So you're more likely to progress to that end goal, completing that line, developing a, behavior, a positive behavior. And it all stems from research um, originally done in the US for a, a car wash who trialed two different loyalty cards. The first loyalty card had eight stamps. The second loyalty card had 10 stamps, but two were pre-filled. Which was the loyalty card that performed the best? It was the one that had the two pre-filled stamps. It was the, that was the card that was completed the most often, that was completed the quickest, and had the most loyal customers. Another lovely graphic here, uh, the Harvard Business Review um, pyramid. Now, two things to take from this slide. Try and involve as many of these points in, that, in, your, in this pyramid as possible in your app. And what you will then create is, is customer loyalty and high engagement. One other thing from this pyramid is emotion again. And it's really important to just ask this simple question when you're designing and building your app. What emotion am I looking to evoke? It might simply be a smile. It might be some stage past emotion, like salivation, which, which is uh, an amusing one. But it's a very simple question, and it acts as a really lovely, simple guiding light to making sure that the value you're creating is, is high enough uh, and, and beneficial to the customer. Now, this is an app that I hope you've all got installed already on your, on your devices. Playbook for Developers, which is a gold mine of, of nuggets for anyone building businesses on top of Google platforms. Um, and I just wanted to showcase two particular biases that are, that are integrated in, into the app. You've got the sunk cost effect, which, by, which is uh, as you spend more time investing within, uh, within a tool or product, uh, you're, you're far less likely to, to leave. And so over, over the days or months that you're using uh, the Playbook app, you're personalizing it. So then you're getting a more personalized feed and, again, less likely to, to leave. Um, then there's the humor effect. Nothing is not really connected to a feature, but it's, it's used here really to create a more lasting memory, which helps with retention. So you know, we always want to get dancing androids into our, into our apps. As I've also mentioned before, it's not always about features. Think about also the low moments in an app's experience, when the network fails, when, something, when there's an internal error within the app, when, you, when you're in that first default state where you don't have any saved items. How can you use these design nudges in a positive way to turn what actually might feel initially quite negative, soften that, and maybe you can even uh, turn that into a positive experience? And, maybe make someone smile by showing a kind of cute robot. The last case study I wanted to, to highlight today was, uh, is the MGemi app, which is uh, an app that sells shoes. And the really interesting bias that they've integrated here is 
that of limited availability. So they have this notion of editions that they release every single week. But within those editions, there's a certain number of shoes, so limited availability actually of the shoes. And then there's a limited window of 12 weeks for each shoe. So the result of all that, they ended up having um, an industry uh, 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 the highest converting sales channel on mobile. Uh, that was their highest converting sales channel. And it was four to five times the industry standards of conversions of push. So it, these things really do work and are very, very useful for both customer and client. All this said, like I've said before, you, with biases, Come power. Um, they can be used for negative, um, negative effect, but it's it's not the time to, to use that. Really, uh, for cre for creating long-term engagement retention, the customer has to be right at the heart of of it all. And you can use this this these positive biases in so many ways to create that positive emotion for the customer. I. So this is peak, always end on a peak end rule bias, which creates a, a longer lasting memory. Find me at the break. I've got a limited number of special things to give up, give out. Um, so a limited availability bias there. Um, also, humor bias creates a longer lasting memory. Merci, danke, thank you.